So that was just a real short uh, part of syntax analysis because that's not the main focus of, uh, of this lecture or this course. What we're going to start doing is from the second stage, which is library definition. And actually, library definition will take us from now until the end of this first part of the, of the synthesis lecture because it's something we have to elaborate on very, uh, very deeply before we go on. So it's all about the standard cells. The library definition stage um, tells the synthesizers where to look for leaf cells for binding and the target library for technology mapping. So basically, if we have all kinds of um, instantiations of uh, types of cells that do not appear, that we don't have a, an RTL description for them, there's no module statement uh, telling about a cell, such as instantiation of a specific um, standard cell from the library or using an, uh, an IP such as an SRAM block or something, that is the leaf cell. And we have to look for those leaf cells and bind our code to the uh, bind our net list to those leaf cells. Um, then we have what we call the target library, which is our standard cell library, which is what we want to map our RTL or our Boolean constructs to. Okay, basically they're just a, a, a set of all of the hard macros that we have. Um, that we have. Okay, so how do we do this? We can first of all take a path where we can search for our libraries. And uh, in Cadence Genus, with the common UI, we use this setDB command that sets all kinds of uh, attributes on our database. And one of the attributes is init lib search path, which is, says where we should look for our lib files, which are the files that uh, describe the uh, timing of our standard cells and our other hard macros for use by the synthesizer. So we just uh, put some path that's on our server where we should look for our lib files and this can be a list of many 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 different uh, paths to help us look for we don't actually need to put the path we can add our full description down below because when we actually read the libraries we use this read libs command and we give it a list of all the libraries that all the library files or the liberty files that we want to read um, in this case we're reading a file called tt1v25c now that's a very strange name that i chose to uh to to use for the example but it's very descriptive of a type of a liberty file each liberty file we'll see uh later is for a certain set of operating conditions and process corners. So in this case, uh, you would often find something like this that is a TT, that's a typical typical, that means that the PMOSs and NMOSs were fabricated in, a, a, in their typical corner. Then one volt, that would be like our main supply voltage, our VDD is one volt, and 25 degrees Celsius would be the temperature that that li library was characterized for. So we're gonna have to give a list of all the libraries at a certain process corner for uh, the tool to look for those leaf cells and uh, and to map the uh, the RTL to, okay. Um, we'll also need to provide a, a Liberty file for all the IPs such as memory macros, IOs, and others. So those are all be in this type of a list over here. And after we um, run this command, our synthesis uh, our synthesis tool will actually go and parse all of those library files. And the library files they have a lot of stuff in them and uh, probably we'll get a whole bunch of warnings hopefully we won't get any errors um, but we have to go over those and understand exactly what those warnings are and if there are any errors look at it really well because it might tell us things that are, are wrong with our uh, library description and you know garbage in garbage out if we give it something that is not correct we're not going to get good results so we just said how we read in a library, but we don't know what a library is. So let's start discussing what a library is. A standard cell library is a collection of well-defined and appropriately characterized logic gates that can be used to implement a digital design. Okay, I really, really like the um, similarity to Legos. So when we take our Legos, we have these little dots over here, and the distance between the dots is well-defined both in the vertical and the horizontal direction. And if we take a Lego and we have to put our like uh, edges a certain distance from, um, from these dots, and if we make a block that is not uh, that doesn't meet these standards, it's not gonna connect with the other blocks and it's just not gonna work. So this is very similar to our standard cell library. We have to provide our logic gates, our inverters and our AND gates and so forth, and they have to adhere to a set of rules. And when they adhere to the set of rules, all the algorithms that we have uh, developed over the years and all of our tools will be able to use those standard cells and glue them all together. But if not, they're just not going to fit and not going to work. 
Okay, so um, in order to do this, what we do, uh, what a, an IP vendor does, they deliver a library, which is basically a set of files that describes these uh, cells that it provides in all kinds of ways, all the information that the different EDA tools need. Um, there is a lot of different information, a lot of different formats and so forth. We're going to discuss some of the important ones just to get uh, an idea of how it works. Um, you will have to actually go and see what each tool that you use needs and how uh, they're provided by your specific library uh, vendor. Okay, so I'm just going to give an example here of a standard cell and how it, 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 what we have to do to make it glue to the other standard cells similar to how the Legos glue to the other standard cells. So this is an AND and uh, we've seen the layout of an AND in, uh, in previous courses and what we can see here is that there is a, a specific height, a distance between this VDD and ground, that's called the cell height, and it has to be standard for all cells. There is a certain type of a width of the standard cells, and we'll see that the width has to be a multiple of a specific number. Okay, um, we have voltage rails. We have the VDD and the ground rails. They have to be a certain width, and they have to be in a certain placement, and um, they provide the power to uh, the cell. We have to have an end well inside the cell, to differentiate between the area of the PMOSs and the area of the NMOSs and also the different P-select and N-select type of uh, um, layers that will be inside here and let us pass our different design rules and make sure that the, the cell will be, um, will be fabricated correctly. And we have pin placement. So as you see here, I drew out this grid. We'll discuss them. They're called tracks and they're horizontal and vertical grids. And we want to put um, all of the pins right on the grid to... Um, to make sure that we can drop vias from a higher level that will connect directly to these different types of pins. Like as you see here, these will be pins in metal one and they will uh, they have to be exactly on the middle of where the metal one is. We have the PR boundary, that's the place and route boundary. So basically, for example, this cell, we say the boundary of the cell is uh, like this over here. And as you can see, it's actually, it doesn't cover the whole cell. And that's because the VDD and ground rails, they're shared with the cells that are in a different row. So if we have our uh, rows of VDD and then ground, and then another VDD maybe here, uh, and another ground down here, what we'll have is we'll have a cell over here and then um, and then the cell will be flipped so that we write an R to show what its direction is and we have the cell that's flipped over here and um, this will have they'll both have this same ground pin uh, that they share with each other so actually the, the effective cell size uh, ends in the middle of this block metal layers so we have to describe what metal layers are inside the cells and ideally standard cells should be routed entirely in metal one and not go above it leaving us the rest of the area for uh, doing uh, more complex routing so what cells are in a standard cell library and we'll start with combinational logic cells nands nors inverters etc as we can see here obviously they're inside the library but that's not all each of these cells comes with a variety of drive strengths. So we have to put the output buffer that's inside the cell. There's some sort of an inverter or a buffer or some sort of uh, um, transistors inside the cell. And we provide different widths of these outputs to be able to drive higher and higher output capacitance. So we'll have lots of those. They're usually called like X1, X2, X3, and so forth to, to describe the size, the relative size of these cells. We have complex cells such as this AND or invert cell. You see there are these two AND gates and they get four inputs and then what this cell does, it actually combines these AND gates with this OR gate and uh, it inverts it. So that's an AND or invert or an AOI cell. We have different types of these like an OR AND invert and so forth. Um, we are able to efficiently make these as a single um, monolithic CMOS gate and so they're provided by the library they can carry out interesting functions. Um, cells that have a fan in up to four. Um, CMOS is really not a good uh, technology for having high fan in gates. It uh, puts serial resistance in at least one of the um, in one of the networks either the pull up or the pull down and therefore it's really bad at driving outputs if they have more than four inputs so usually we have standard cells up to four inputs uh, up to four a uh, fan in of four eco cells we'll describe later that's engineering change order cells those are bonus cells that we can use to fix all kinds of problems that we have during the design 
Next uh, category is buffers and inverters. So we already did say inverter up here, but buffers and inverters are kind of special cells. Uh, we have lots of them. We use them for re as uh, repeaters to drive large loads and so forth. So we'll have many more uh, sizes of buffers and inverters than of other logic cells. Um, not only that, we have something that we call clock cells, which are cells with balanced rise and fall delays to minimize the skew um, once we build our clock tree, which we'll describe in, a, in one of the later lectures. Okay, we have delay cells. These are cells that um, just, uh, as, they, as they say, they have a really bad propagation delay. They delay uh, signals. We use them often, for instance, for hold fixing. And then we have level shifters, which are another type of a buffer that allows us to communicate between um, multiple supply voltage areas or power domains, as they're known as. Okay, um, sequential cells. So we have li lots of different types of flip-flops, positive and negative edge uh, triggered, set reset, uh, with Q and Q bar outputs, with enable without enable, so forth. We have latches, we have integrated clock gating cells, and we have scan enabled cells for automatic test pattern generation. All of these things I'll describe in full in the coming slides. Finally, we have physical cells, such as fillers, tap cells, antennas, decaps, end caps, and tie cells. These are different cells that have uh, different functionality that we need, but they don't actually change the Boolean. They, they, they're not connected usually to any um, signals, and they don't change the Boolean functionality uh, of, the, uh, of the circuit. So let's start dr uh, diving down deep into those different types of cells and we'll start with multiple drive strengths and vts so as i mentioned before um, each type of standard cell is usually provided with several drive strengths so as you can see here there's a transistor with a width of uh, one and a half microns and here's another transistor with a width of three microns um, and this one's much better at driving uh, an output than this one is, but it also has more leakage. And if uh, we have to do it with fingers or so forth, it will take up more area. And so we'll provide several types of these. This one we may call something like 1x or x1 or d1 or something like that. And this may be 2x or x2 or something. We're not usually knowledgeable. We don't have the knowledge of what the actual sizes are inside. Um, in most of the views, we don't really care. We mainly care about how their propagation delay is um, is relative to the output load, and uh, we'll discuss that later. The other option of these types of cells is what we call multiple threshold cells, or MT CMOS. Um, what uh, what happened was uh, over the years is that um, fabrication technology allowed us to actually just change the uh, the VT the threshold voltage of transistors by adding or subtracting a certain type of a, a mask on uh, and process step. And so what we do usually is we provide equivalent footprint cells. So let's say we have a, a type of an inverter, and this would be an inverter cell, and we don't know exactly what's going on inside, but there's some sort of a uh, a poly with a bunch of diffusions inside and um, we can go and then take the same exact inverter add a mask on that makes it a low VT mask and then all these transistors will be made with low VT and that will make it have a, a better drive strength because the VT is lower um, on the other hand it'll have more leakage so if we see that we're not on a critical path we can take this cell and just replace this single mask with a high VT mask, okay? And the high VT mask will make these transistors much less leaky and give us lower power. It will cost the, in the propagation delay of the cell, but if it's not on a critical path, we may not care. So we uh, usually provide equivalent libraries with different VTs. Sometimes nowadays you'll have five, six, even seven different VT options for a, a single standard cell library. And again, since they're exactly the same size and have the same footprint, we can just uh, really mix and match between these um, at late stages of the design after we've already done place and, placement and routing. So the next type of cell that we'll elaborate upon is the clock cell. And in general, standard cells are optimized for speed. That does not mean that they're balanced. So we learned before that um, TPD or propagation delay is the average or usually it's defined as the average of the low to high and the high to low transition of a cell. Um, when we minimize that and try to make the perfect cell, we get some sort of a beta ratio, a ratio between the pull up and the pull down in the CMOS cells, but it does not mean 
that we get a, 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 an equality here between the low to high and the high to low transition. So balanced cells are not necessarily the fastest cells, and usually what we have in a standard cell library in general is the fastest cell that we can make. Um, however, that's really bad for clock nets. When we have unbalanced rising and falling delays, we get un unwanted skew, which we'll learn about later. Okay, so that's why we have these special clock cells that are designed with balanced rising and falling uh, delays. That That's both in... Uh, in the TPLH, TPHL, and in the T-Rise and T-Fall at the outputs. So we try to make as balanced of cells as we can and provide them as what we call clock cells. You usually don't want to use these cells during your um, standard logic synthesis because, as I said, they're not optimized for speed. And in general, when we have so many cells in our standard cell library, it's best to, to, to not um, confuse the synthesizer in things that we don't actually want to use or want to take into account. Um, in general, also, we want to only use buffers and inverters on clock nets, uh, but sometimes we need all kinds of special gating logic. Sometimes we have like clock uh, multiplexers and once in a while all kinds of NANDs and ANDs and so forth, but we don't usually want to have any logic on our clock. Um, we'll discuss that later. Usually we want the clock to be very clean. Um, however, there are special cells like integrated clock uh, gate gates over here, and we'll learn about them more at the end of uh, lecture of part two of this lecture but they're provided uh, as clock cells in our library and they're also going to be optimized to be balanced the next category that we want to discuss is sequentials so sequentials of course are flip-flops and latches and um, generally we are going to use almost only flip-flops uh, we also do get a set of latches inside our standard cell library but there are lots of flip-flops and why are there lots of flip-flops well just take a look at this flip-flop here it has a reset pin it has an enable pin right it has a q output so we have to have all kinds of flavors of those so we can infer different latches from the the different rtl constructs that we're going to write so that means that we have positive and negative edge triggered uh, latches so that's kind of two categories we need synchronous and asynchronous reset but we can also have set so and we can have different combinations we can have both reset and set or and they can be both synchronous um, or uh, asynchronous so that's a lot of categories maybe six of those right then we can have the outputs be q and we can have q bar we can only have one of them or have both of them right we can have uh, these enables or we cannot provide the enables and then there's what we call scan which i'm not going to discuss right now but uh, when we discuss uh, design for test we'll discuss what a scan flip-flop is but you see we add a type of multiplexer to the the flip-flop and so we have to provide each and every one of these sets and combinations so you, you're talking about dozens of flip-flops uh, different drive strengths in the output buffers as well so sequentials are a big part of our standard cell library there's also going to be some encoding that tells us what the name of the flip-flop is what it actually means okay next I, I just am going to mention uh, briefly level shifters they're a type of a buffer right uh, level shifter is a cell that's placed between voltage domains to pass signals from one voltage to another we can't usually just uh, send a signal at one voltage to a signal at, uh, to a uh, uh, to a signal that's powered by a different voltage actually for the high to low shifter as you can see in, in this little picture it's just a for a buffer it's a set of two inverters and they only need one voltage supply to do this so it's actually just a regular old buffer um, one of the main reasons we need a special cell in the standard cell library is because it has to be characterized for the fact that its input is at one voltage and its output is at another voltage um, on the other hand a low to high shifter is not that easy um, it actually needs to take a low voltage and uh, and uh, drive it up to the high voltage at the output and we usually use some sort of like cross couple DC VSL type of a, of a structure here to make those and again we have to characterize them both for the input voltage and the output voltage um, these are very complex cells often they come in double height uh, so they take up two standard cell rows some uh, stuff about physical cells so filler and tap cells um, what happens is when we place our design what we do is we put a bunch of standard cells around we'll have one here and one here and one here but they won't be uh, exactly ad 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 adjacent to each other there'll be these empty spaces in between so all of these uh, type things they're empty spaces that we leave uh, for routing and just for all kinds of reasons that we'll learn about during placement um, but if we have such a such a space 
what we're going to have uh, what we're going to have is discontinuity in in different layers such as our wells so we have one cell here with our rails right and another cell here that's a bit far away with its rails and uh, remember that there's this uh, n well that's inside of here well if the n well is only here and here then we have to actually tap this to vdd and we have to tap this to vdd and that would be a waste of area so what we would do at the end is we'll take a filler cell which has nothing but things such as it's like a dummy cell that just has a continuity of the well and if we just tap one of those uh, this whole well will be tapped it's also used for density fillers uh, there are different reasons to have these fill cells and we have to put them in our whole um, our whole uh, core will be filled with these uh, taps with these filler cells after uh, when we finish our design Okay, um, in some uh, technologies, mainly newer technologies, we have what we call end caps. These are different uh, special cells that we put at the ends of rows. Um, they are able to finish the row in a clean way. Um, newer technologies even have end caps that we have to put uh, top, bottom, different ones maybe for the corners. So um, you get a set of these end caps and instructions in your standard cell library, how to use them and where to put them in. Other fillers may include uh, MOS capacitors, and um, that's for connecting VDD and ground. So um, what I want to do actually is in any DC voltage, I want to have a capacitor between uh, between any like uh, VDD and ground, right? This type of a capacitor will clean any type of noise uh, that will go out of here and all kinds of voltage droops and so forth. So we want as much capacitance as possible between VDD and ground. And one way to do that is just stick a capacitor right here in these filler cells. Um, and we can do that with different types of MOS caps. Um, we call the cells that uh, are fillers, we call them decap cells. Okay, uh, another type of uh, filler or a physical cell is what we call a well tap. So I mentioned here that we have to tap this to VDD. We have to put VDD in there and over here we have to put ground in, in, in the substrate. So um, in, in the past, in older technologies, we used to have these types of uh, taps inside our standard cells. Um, actually, we don't need to tap the well so often that it would be in each standard cell and takes up a lot of area. So instead, we have special cells such as this uh, filler cell, which has these well taps. All it does is it connects the uh, substrate to VSS and the N well to VDD. And we have some sort of a design rule such as tw every 20 micron to scatter these around the design. And you can see here that these are these uh, well taps that are pre-scattered around the design. And we just make sure that inside every well, we have one of them uh, all the time. Okay, um, there is an additional possibility with well tapping. We've discussed in the past uh, body biasing, which can help us change the threshold voltage. Um, it's not very common to do in modern technologies except for in, uh, in fully depleted SOI. But if we want to do that, we take the same cell. We just do not make this connection between VDD and the cell. Rather, we take this well tap and connect it to whatever our uh, well voltage is. Um, uh, so that's another possibility. And so you may be provided with such, such uh, biasing cells as well. The next category I want to... Um, uh, to discuss is engineering change order cells. So uh, I don't think many engineers will remember uh, that ECO stands for engineering change order, but ECO is one of those three letter words that everybody discusses. And ECO is basically a very late change in the design. Usually we do it after place and route, um, and uh, sometimes we actually do it after fabrication for a respin of the chip in what's called a metal fix. Okay, um, there's a strange picture here on the right side. I was on a, a trip, a field trip, and we ran into this type of a strange fix that was uh, applied to this um, water pipe somewhere uh, in one of the national parks. And my friend uh, who works at one of the uh, VLSI companies here in Israel said, hey, when you see that, that's an ECO. Why don't you teach your students and show them the, uh, an example of an ECO? It's a real poor ECO, but obviously this was some sort of a late fix they did in the design. Okay, so um, we have to, an ECO is a very important part in uh, developing a chip. The reason being that um, uh, what happens is that uh, we, that it's very expensive to 
to not only re-spin a chip to make a whole tape out, but it's also very expensive just to run a whole place and route flow, which can take a long time. It can take days, in fact. And sometimes we don't have time and we find a late bug or want to make some sort of a hold fix or something like that, and we need to do a real small change. So how can we do this after placement? Or worse, how can we do this after tape out? So uh, w one solution that is done is what we call uh, spare or bonus cells. So we can scatter these green cells here. They're just a set of cells that we scatter around the design. Um, it's some sort of predetermined set. And we say these are bonus cells. They're just connected to ground or VDD. Their gates are, and, and their gates are connected to ground or VDD, so they don't actually do anything. Um, but what, what it means is that if we find some sort of a problem, we can go and uh, let's say this is some sort of a, an inverter here, and we find out that this flip-flop uh, let's say this is a flip-flop, it, it, it actually was it accidentally was getting an inverted signal and we need to invert it. So we'll take the metal piece that was connecting here, say to the clock, we'll disconnect it, we'll move it over to there and reconnect this here. So this uh, little piece of net will disappear and instead we'll use a new piece of metal. But this, uh, the, the, the transistors and so forth are already there. Now, first of all, um, after place and route, we can do just an incremental route and fix that area. Um, and that'll take a lot less time than running a whole uh, place and route flow over again. But actually after tape out, we can um, do that type of a fix and we don't have to re, uh, redo the masks that make all the transistors, which are the most expensive part of the process. We may be even able just in one or two metal layers to respin them without changing anything else. And then uh, it'll be much cheaper and we'll save money that way. So ECOs are something that are often done and uh, we use these bonus cells to, to do it. Um, the bonus cells are basically similar to any other standard cell, but we uh, have we give them a different name so it's easy to identify them in the net list and find them uh, in order to use them later. Okay, so um, we get to my favorite word, which is abstraction, um, which I use a lot. And uh, the question is, what is a cell? So a uh, detailed layout, right? When we take this layout that shows our poly and our, um, and our diffusions and whatever metals and contacts and stuff connect. Uh, I guess if we looked at the layout of a standard cell, we could figure out what it is. We could reverse engineer it, understand that it's an inverter or an AND gate, what its W and L are. We could even figure out, uh, we could run some spice simulations and figure out its, uh, its uh, delay and so forth. But do we really want to do that? I mean, that would take a long time, right? So instead, um, what we should do is we should go and figure out for the tool that we're running and the operation that we're doing exactly what kind of uh, information do we need. So for example, when we do logic simulation, we all we need to know is that inverter, it changes a zero into a one and a one into a zero. We don't really care if the inverter is made with a CMOS style or pseudo NMOS style or something else. Okay, um, we don't need to know what kind of transistors are inside a cell when we when we run synthesis. We just need to know the size of the cell and and the delay. So what we're going to do to make life and calculation simpler, we're going to abstract away this info, and each tool will only get the data it really needs. This will help us really improve um, runtime. It will even help us uh, keep keep our data a bit more confidential. So um, saying that, let's look at what we have in our standard cell library. Okay, so generally, this is a very high level overview. There may be a lot more stuff inside, but um, at least we'll have this type of stuff. So we have behavioral views. These are usually Verilog descriptions of, uh, of our standard cells, and they're used for civil, uh, simulation and logic equivalents. It's actually just a Verilog file that says what the cell is and has all kinds of things for doing uh, cool stuff like SDF back annotation, which we may discuss in the future. So as you see, this would be kind of a .v, a Verilog file. There is a type of file called Vital, which is what VHDL um, used to provide, but it's it's not used very much, very often, and actually not usually supplied by the by the by the library vendors. Um, physical views of the cells. So um, when we do need to run the tape out, we need to run a full DRC check and an LVS check and so forth. 
Um, what we'll need is the, the actual layout of the cell. This is provided usually as a GDS2 format. That's the format that talks about the layout. Um, however, uh, we don't need to know all that information. Um, for example, when we're running place and route, it's, it's, it's heavy. It, it takes up a lot of memory and so forth. So instead, we'll provide what we call a, a physical abstract or a layout abstract, um, which we usually use the library exchange format the left format so over here we have left cells and gds cells um, synopsis uses some different uh, uh, proprietary formats but we'll discuss left format in this course then we have the transistor level abstraction or the transistor level uh, files so when we want to run spice on um, on our on our net list and sometimes we want to do that and when we run around LVS and so forth what we'll need is the actual spice net list of our files with the transistors and so forth we'll often have it uh, a version that has just the transistors we may have a version that is after um, parasitic uh, extraction and so forth so uh, those will be like SPI sometimes CDL files and others then uh, maybe the most important file that we get inside our standard cell library is the timing and power files. These are the liberty files or the .lib files. Um, and Synopsys uses their own proprietary .db um, uh, uh, format. But these are files that have characterizations of timing and power for static timing analysis um, and for other things. Okay, then we'll have things like power grid views, which, uh, show, which uh, enable us to do IR drop and power analysis and other different types of things like we may have uh, symbols just to make nice drawings in our schematics of the symbols or we may get things like the OA libraries that's uh, Cadence's open access format which uh, lets us have easy integration with Virtuoso so these are uh, 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 this is uh, not all the files we may get inside a standard cell library but as you can see it's already a lot um, and these are things that are often provided just as a side note um, at universities and small companies and uh, we may not get what we call full backend views so for example GDS and uh, maybe spice or CDL files may not be provided um, they're not necessarily needed for a place in route run we can deal just with the left files the lib files the dot V files um, we can uh, that can be sufficient for just a purely digital backend run and this is a lot of times what is provided to universities